Come on, church, let's sing. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. You brought me out of darkness. You have filled me with peace. Give her mercy on my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. We are excited to worship with you guys today. I want to continue with just open us up in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for a presence that is tangible this morning. 
we obviously welcome you this morning, but we know you're here with us. So I just pray that as we continue to sing, as we lift these words up, as we study your word, I pray that you help us to understand that presence a little bit better. Help us to see that you are here with us, that you want us, that you're calling us deeper. So we thank you for that this morning. We lift your name in worship. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he was did white as snow. to say my lips shall still repeat You guys can go ahead and have a seat. Those words can kind of be a little bit um, unusual for us. Just the idea of us giving it all, 
can be kind of foreign uh, for our culture. But as we go into this time of offering, I want us to try to shift our minds and not to think about that saying as giving it all just financially. Because God kind of deserves more than that. Amen? So let's pray. And I know we're not giving uh, as an act together right now, but let's pray together as a community over our offering this morning. Father, we again thank you for having an opportunity to worship you this morning. And as we worship through our giving, I pray that you can just help us to dig a little bit deeper. Help us to understand that the act of offering isn't just about money. And when we sing those words, all to him we owe, that it's, it's about life transformation. So I pray that we can offer you our lives this morning. Help us to be better followers of Jesus. And then as we prepare to open your word this morning, just prepare our hearts. Open our ears this morning to, to be receptive of what you have for us. We thank you for a love that is tangible. We thank you for a presence that is real. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. I'll spend less time with God. I will hide my faith from my co-workers. This year, I will spend more and tithe less. I will read the Bible as little as possible. I will remain silent when I know I should speak. This year. This year. This year, I will not share my faith with my best friend. I will shirk leadership responsibilities every chance I get. I will continue to justify my bad behavior. And give God my leftovers. This year? This year? This year, I will let the busyness of life squeeze God out. Well, good morning, church. Happy New Year. So glad you guys could be here and gals could be here with us this morning. Now, those are some resolutions that if you want to break, I'm 100% okay with your breaking when it comes down to it. It seems ridiculous when you kind of hear that, and we're going to talk a little bit about that here this morning in our first Sunday together, and, and, uh, but it is good to be back with you. I almost feel like I need to introduce myself as the new pastor. You know, I was joking this morning, someone said, who are you? And I said, I'm the new guy because they fired the old guy because he never showed up. Um, and that, and the year didn't end the way we wanted it in the Beals family with COVID and, and me being in the hospital, uh, before that, uh, with some other issues and stuff, but you know, through it all, one of the things my family rejoice in is the fact that, uh, you know, God, it didn't change who God was. And we were so, so, so thankful for that. And so thankful for all the people during that time that stepped up to help out to be here at Christmas Eve and the Sunday after and everything uh, when the staff kind of came down with it and was sick. And there's a lot of other sicknesses that are going on right now besides COVID that people are dealing with and that, and I know they would appreciate uh, your prayers. And before I dive in, I just want to remind you again uh, uh, of an awesome class that we're starting next Sunday, the 9th. If you're watching online, you want to call and sign up for it, we'd, we'd love to make you a part of that. And it's, it's in uh, how to interpret the Bible. And it's a great class. And, and uh, we're going to be doing that, like I said, right after second service. You don't even need to plan a meal. Just come in here and then right after go on in and, and we'll have a meal together. And then just uh, for four Sundays, the last, uh, uh, from January, in January here, we'll be talking and taking a look at, you know, how, how do we interpret what we have, this Bible that we open and that we read, you know, that we learned as we did that series, that six-week series on how we got the Bible, which is awesome, but now how do we take and how do we interpret it today? Um, and, and to do that, it's a wonderful class, and I encourage you to sign up and, and be a part of that. But, you know, we're, we're at that time of year. It's the first Sunday. I always joke. I always tease. I never miss. I've been here um, 20 years now, and I've never missed saying this on the first Sunday of the year that, you know, you all should congratulate yourselves, give you a high five, give yourself a golden sticker. You're, you haven't missed church at all this year. So great job. That's the way. Stay with it, you know, and keep up the good work. Uh, uh, definitely. Uh, when it comes to that, but we're in that time of year where there's a lot of reflection that takes place. 
you know, through this past week between Christmas and New Year's, there were shows being played where, you know, they were the, the year in review type of shows, and, and this is, you know, what you do, and this is what's happened, you know, last year, here were some tragic things that happened, here were some great things, and people use this time as a time of reflection, to look back and to reflect and to realize all that we have to be thankful for and to realize the things that we can celebrate in our life. And, you know, as I was sitting there and preparing this and planning and thinking about, you know, uh, this Sunday and what I wanted to share and everything, I started looking back and, and reflecting over the blessings that this church has had. And, and uh, there was this long, long list. And I thought, well, I'm just going to pick two out of that list because maybe some of you realize this. Maybe some of you have been here a long time know this. And, and, and two wonderful blessings that God has given us, two things that we can celebrate and, and should celebrate that this year makes our 179th anniversary of being a church. Williamsville Christian Church has been around 179 years. In 1843, a group of people got together and started the church. Now, it wasn't here in Williamsville because Williamsville wasn't here yet. It was actually next door in Fancy Prairie. And then in 1853, when Williamsville started to come about, we moved over and we bought the property and the church sat forever where the library is now until 2009 <clears throat> when that little wind came through and decided to level the church. Uh, and, uh, and, and so for the last 10 years, which that's another thing to celebrate is this month is our 10 year anniversary in this building. And that's amazing. Yeah. Woo. I can't believe we've already been in this building, you know, for the, for 10 years. And to think back just in that 10 year period, let alone the 179 years, all the wonderful, neat things that we've seen happen here, the ministries that's taken place from all the ages, people that have given their life to Christ, the way God has used us to minister and, and uh, through everything. It, it's just such a neat, neat thing. And, and the tragedy would be, as we hear that and we give thanks and we celebrate right now today, to sit there and think, wow, you know, that's awesome and the best is behind us. That would be a tragedy for us to think that way. Yeah, it'd be kind of like last August when Melinda and I celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. If I would have come in, you know, the house and I would have given her some cards and flowers and, you know, her favorite dark chocolate candy and, and all that and taken her out at her favorite restaurant to eat. And I said, honey, the last 30 years have been the best of the best of the best. And the best is behind us. You know, it's all down here, hill from now. You know, I mean, it wouldn't have been a good anniversary and that would have been a tragic way to look at our life. And it's the same way with the church. It'd be tragic to think that the best is behind us because I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure God hasn't come back yet. And since God hasn't come back yet, that means God is not finished with us yet. And that's why the leadership here, we, we, you'll see us from time to time. You'll hear it in my messages. You'll see it placed at different places that we like to keep our purpose before you because it can be real easy to forget. Why are we here? Why do we exist as a church? And so we'll do our best to keep our purpose. And our purpose, we believe that we're here, is to love Him, to serve them, and disciple all. And so as leadership, when we look to do anything, if you're wondering, like, if you have a ministry or if you come to us or why we said no to this ministry or whatever, we always ask ourselves, is the ministries that we're doing, the ministries we're being asked to do, whatever it may be, they may be outstanding great ministries, but we always ask ourselves, does this fulfill the purpose which we believe why God has placed WCC here? And if it does, we look what we can do to partner. And if not, we, we encourage them and try to help them and find people that can support and be there uh, in that ministry. But, but we do that because we believe it's important to know that and, and to understand that. And that's also why, like last November, Gary Turnbull stood up here before you. And as he was getting ready, as announcing that we were going to have our annual meeting to vote on the budget, all that business stuff we have to do, he also shared with you our vision for 22. And what we wanted to do, how we wanted to reach more people in the Williamsville Sherman area, how we wanted to have more people plugged into small groups, how we wanted, uh, you know, to encourage people to start coming back and being a part of, of church uh, and, and, and getting plugged in, how we wanted people to be reading more and getting in. And that's why, like this past week, you got an email from me. And if you want that email, if you fill out the little card that's there, I can send it to you. But I sent out four Bible reading plans, and I encourage you to choose one of those plans and start yesterday, start reading so we as a church together can read through the Bible in a year. And on a side note, I don't want you to be legalistic about that. Some people have their own Bible reading program, and that's great. Use that. But we wanted to give you some options in case you didn't. But I don't want you to be legalistic. And what I mean by that is, say you, you find one of the plans you like and you're reading and you start off and, and the first two or three months are going great, but then something happens and, and you miss 
two, three, four, five, six days, and you think, oh, man, I got all that reading I got to make up on, and I got to do this, and da 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 and, and, and usually what people do is just forget it. We're saying is, don't say forget it, just start with where you're at. Start with where, whatever that day is, start on that day because we, we don't want you to be legalistic and it's like, oh, we just want to make sure that you're reading and in God's word because as we read God's word, that's where we understand how much God loves us and allows us to fall even more in love with God. And maybe one of the things that can help encourage you uh, during that time and throughout the year is to find somebody which you could be like an, what we call an accountability partner. And again, not to be legalistic about it, but, you know, just someone that you can text or maybe email or call or go out for a Coke or whatever, a coffee, and just say, hey, how are you doing in your reading plan? To kind of encourage each other to read through because we believe it's important to read God's Word and to fall in love, like I said, with God. So those are things that are important to us that we'll keep before you. And, you know, when I was growing up, this whole church stuff, you know, it was highly, highly important to our family. I mean, going to church wasn't even a question. Church always came first. You never, ever heard the statement in my family used a church. As long as there's nothing better to do, we'll go to church. Ah, yeah, we might have used that in other aspects, but we never, ever used it when it came to church. Our calendar was full of the church things, and if somebody came to us and said, hey, can you? Well, no, I can't because I have this at church. I mean, that church was important to us. In the community that I grew up in, there was a lot of people that went to church. A lot of my friends went to church, but I remember one summer specifically, and I remember this summer specifically because the, the Baptist church in town, they decided to do like an all summer kind of like vacation Bible school. They started a busing program. And what they did was they'd send the, kid, the buses out in the morning to pick up the kids, bring them back to the church for about three to four hour like a vacation Bible school, lessons and lunch, and then bring them back home. And they did that through the summer. And almost all my friends went to that. So church that summer became a really, really big thing. It became such a big thing that just out of my house, you could walk over about 100 yards, there was this crick or creek. I mean, the right way is creek, you know, and if you want to be a creek person, you can be a creek person, but I'm trying to start you in the new year to say things right. It's creek. There was this creek that had this forest and everything around it, and that's where we played as kids. That's where our forts were. That's where we went, you know, had war games and all that other kind of stuff you do as a kid, but that summer, church became so important that at our forts, we played church. You know, everybody was going to this church program, and we thought, hey, let's start designing our own church and having church in our little forts. And can you imagine this, kids, you know, doing this? And so we would sit and we would talk about, hey, how we're going to do church and what we were going to have and who was going to sing and who was going to give. You know, at that point, it seemed like an hour devotion, which might have been 30 seconds, but you know, when you're 10, that's a long time to talk to a group of kids. And we had a big church. It was like 12 to 15 of us that gathered there, you know, so we had like a mega church back then of these kids in the community, and we would gather and we would play church, and we did that all summer long, and I got thinking about that as I was going through what I wanted to share today, and, and I think one of the sad things you can see and, and, and imagine kids doing that, kids getting excited about that, but I think one of the things that maybe has happened, especially in our culture today, as a lot of kids that grow up become adults, they continue to to play church. They continue to play church. And what I mean by that is this, that there's a lot of buildings uh, uh, like ours here in the United States right now where people are doing what you're doing. They're either online watching those of you that are online or they've gathered in the building as you have gathered here. And they're experiencing church. They're coming in, maybe singing some songs, maybe different songs, but singing songs and maybe, you know, having a time of an offering, maybe as we're going to be in a little bit of time of communion and hearing some kind of devotion or sermon being given. And then they're all going to leave the buildings and, and they're going to go home. They're going to leave the buildings, go home, and nothing will have changed. Nothing's going to change in their lives. Nothing's going to change in their community. They, they simply have found themselves, for whatever reason, just kind of going through the motion playing church. And as you read through scriptures and everything, I, I think we all agree that God didn't call and create us to play church, did he? God called and created us to be the church, to be the church. And you know, like I said at the beginning, this, this WCC has been around for 179 years because there were people that understood that. There were people that 
were the church. I, I'm, I'm sure during that 179 years, there were people that were playing the church as well. It happens in all churches of all sizes, of all denominations. But for 179 years, there were people that understood that they needed to go out and they needed to share. They needed to be the light. They understood that they were the hands and the feet uh, uh, you know, of the church. And it made a difference in the community. And a lot of the times when I talk about this, I share about this, I preach about this, the main question that comes back, especially today, is, Dave, how, how do we know how to be the church? I mean, there's a lot of material out there. There's seminars that are given out there. There's books that you can read to say this is what the church should look like. And, and it's not that those are bad in any way, shape, or form when it comes down to it, but we have the greatest book of all that helps us understand what the purpose of the church is. And, of course, that's God's Word, His Scripture. And it does a very good job of helping us understand what our purpose should be. So in the rest of our time together, what I'd like to do is I want to look at three churches specifically in the book of Revelation. There's actually seven churches that are addressed, seven young churches that started out. And these young churches, they were excited and they started doing some, some wonderful things, but they had lost, in a sense, their way. They had forgotten their purpose. And I want to look at three of them and see what Jesus had said to them, how he encouraged them or how he rebuked them and, and where they were and see how they're applicable to us today some 2,000 years later. And the first church that I want to look at that he addresses is the church in Ephesus. And the church in Ephesus is, is what we call a church that's lacking in, in love. And he starts off, when he starts talking to them, at first he starts talking about some things that they're doing good because there were a couple things that they were doing that was good and then we get to Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, and he says this, yet, meaning all those are good, but yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, a lot of the times when you hear that passage uh, read, you know, some translations say you have forsaken your first love. They, they only talk about how you have forgotten how to love God and how much God loves you. And, and I believe that that's a part of it. But remember our command from Christ on how we are to love. Remember when he came to him and, the, and he said, look, at this is how you're to love. You're to love God with what? All your heart, mind, soul, body, and strength. And what did he tag onto that? And you are to love your neighbors as yourself. Those go right together. How we are to love God and how we are to love... I mean, that's part of our purpose here, you know, to love Him and to serve Him and disciple all. That's what we are to do. And, and, and you know, we love God by serving others and, and everything. And so I, I would suggest that, that, you know, the church here, it forgotten not only how to love God, but it just forgotten how to go out and be the love of God. And so as we come into 22, as we take this time and we have this reflective time of year, I think it's a good thing, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, that we remember. But the other church I want to take a look at is the Church of Philadelphia. And it was known as the Faithful Church, or it's come to known today, we call it the Faithful Church. When Jesus addressed them, he said this in Revelations 3, 8 and 11. He says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet... You have kept my word and have not denied my name. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. It doesn't appear that things were easy for this church, you know, but it seemed like and it appears that they were faithful. And Jesus' words to this church were so beautiful. Hold on. Hold on to what is good. Hold on to what is right. Hold on to what is true. Hold on to the purpose for which I created you. Keep loving the way that God has loved you. Keep loving your neighbor as yourself because if you don't, that crown can come and be taken away. So hold on to that truth and live that truth. And the third church is the church in Laodicea, which we've affectionately come to call today the lukewarm church and addressed it as that. In Revelations 3, 15 and 16, and then down in verse 19, the words to the church were this. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Down in verse 19. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. And when we look at this church in Laodicea, it's not necessarily that they were bad. It's not that not like they were doing a bunch of these great evil things. It just says that they were lukewarm and because they were lukewarm he was gonna spit them out and this is where i like like 
translations like the message translation and, and that some people don't like the message translation i understand why but i think the message translation does a beautiful job of actually painting a much better picture of the greek words here in the message translation if you were to read this verse it states that yeah i have found you stale and i have found you stagnant so much to the point that i can't stand you that i am going to vomit you out of my mouth <laughs> that's a little different picture isn't it i mean there's one thing to get spit out it's another thing to vomit you know i mean <laughs> welcome to church happy new year you know but i mean i love those images i'm giving you don't you but i mean i mean think about that how would you like to be known as the church that caused christ to vomit <laughs> you know it's just not a, a nice thing that's there and again again it's not that this church was a really bad evil awful church they had just forgotten their purpose they had forgotten their purpose so god says look it you need to repent you need to repent so when you hear about those three churches what does that have to do with us in this new year of 2022 when we when we hear them what does that have to do with us as as, as a church family here i mean when we look at churches around you know, the U.S. and around the world? Are there churches that are struggling like this? Sure. Are there churches that are struggling with their ministries? Absolutely. Are there churches that are out there that, that you know, are allowing the culture to define what is right instead of God's word that need to stand for? Yeah, sure there are. Are there churches that have bad teaching and maybe some sin that's going on and has leadership that's like, well, who are we to judge? And so they allow it and there's a struggle that goes on? Yeah, I mean, sadly, again, it doesn't matter the size of the church, the denominational location. Yes, that happens out there. And I think there's some things that we can, and I'm not saying that that's where we are in that situation, but I think it's a really good thing to look at these things as we're having this reflective time, as we start this new year, to make sure, you know, that we are fulfilling the purpose in our life that God wants us to fulfill. Because there's some things he told, two specific things I want to look at, like the church of Laodicea. He said these words. He said, I want you to repent. And you hear repentance being talked about, you know, in the church all the time. But I think it's gotten a very negative connotation in our world, in our culture today. And I, I think we've lost the true meaning of it because repentance is more than saying, I'm sorry. I mean, we can, you know, do something and be sorry, but that doesn't mean we repent. It's like after second service here, if, if, if we get done and I run out to my car because I'm in a hurry and I jump in the car and I back out real quick and wham, slam right into your car. Now, I might jump out and say, oh, I'm so sorry, Billy. I didn't mean to hit your car. Please forgive me. And Billy, being the wonderful, nice, loving guy that he is, might look at me and say, okay, Dave, <clears throat> you know, we'll, we'll get insurance to work with. Okay, we'll get insurance, but right now I'm late, you know, and, and, and everything. I jump back in my car, and bam, I back up and hit Billy's car again. And this time, Billy, I am so sorry. <laughs> you know, and, and the words that he's thinking, he might not want to be saying and, and stuff like that. But if I jump in my car and hit her the third time at that particular point, I'm sure Billy's going to be like, knock it off before I knock you off. All right. And it's not going to be there. I mean, I could say I'm sorry all I want. What repentance means is, and I haven't repented, I can say and apologize, you see, because repenting is stopping the wrong behavior and starting the correct behavior. That's what biblical repentance is. Stopping the behavior that's wrong that goes against God and working to correct that behavior and do what God wants. So when you hear God say repent, all right, he's meaning stop walking away, you know, from me, doing things that I haven't created you to do, that I haven't asked you to do, you know, that I don't want you to do and turn around and start walking back towards me, listening to me, following me, being me and obeying me. And sometimes people, when I say that, like they, you know, because like they think, wow, repentance, that's kind of harsh. Isn't that kind of judgmental? But what about mercy and grace and forgiveness? Absolutely. God is a merciful God. He is a God full of grace and forgiveness to levels and ways we can't comprehend in our minds sometimes. How can he forgive somebody? How can he have that much mercy and grace? And that needs to be preached. That needs to be taught. But I also think as a church, we need to be teaching about true biblical repentance because i believe that god says look i love you enough i care for all of you enough that i don't want you to stay where you are i mean that's why i sent my son christ to die for you on the cross i care i believe god says i care about what you believe i care about what you're doing i care about the way that you're living but if any of those 
are contrary to the purpose for which I've created you, now we've got to struggle. Now you've got to struggle. Now you need to repent. And again, I'm not talking about beating people up over the head. See, when I was raised, like I said, in that church and that culture and stuff like that, uh, on Friday nights, sometimes Saturday nights, but usually Friday nights, you know, we used to drive the main drag and that called Scoop the Loop. I don't know what it was called around here, but in Newton, Iowa, you would drive up Main Street and then you'd, that'd bring you to the square and then you'd go around the block and then you'd go back down and you'd just continue to do that. And that's like when gas was 50 cents a gallon and, and dad paid for it. You know, so it didn't matter. So that's what you, everybody did on, you know, honking the horns, you know, waving and all that. And we had a guy every Friday night, sometimes Saturday, but definitely every Friday night, stood on the corner with the Bible and a bullhorn. And you know what he did if you were from that time, that culture and stuff like that. He stood right there and he would yell in that bullhorn, repent or you're going to burn in hell. And then he'd quote some scripture, repent, you're going to burn in hell. And I used to have a blast being some of the great, you know, <laughs> 10 fingers pointing here. You know, I had some of the best, I mean, I'd drive up and down on that thinking, what's the next sarcastic line I can say to that guy on the corner and, you know, and yell it out at him and stuff like that, you know? And, 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 and so we, we, we think of that picture of somebody yelling, repent or burn in hell or repent or whatever and all that. And that's the image that we have. That's the image that we have. But when you look at how Christ did it, remember when Jesus was here? Who did he meet with? Sinners, tax collectors. I mean, in his culture, in his time, those were the lowest of the lowest. But yet he talked to them in such a way. He spoke truth to them. He brought a truth into their life, but he shared it with them in such a way that they stopped, they repented, they stopped doing the wrong, and they made a correction to come back to do the right. I've heard it put this way. I love this saying. Jesus loved the sin out of people. Don't you love that picture? He loved the sin right out of them. And if that's the example that's given to us by Christ, who we're supposed to obey and follow, then each and every day, that's what we need to be looking as we come into 22, as we're in 22, as we go out in this new year. That's how we're to love other people, the way that Christ first loved us, and to show and to demonstrate that kind of love that's there. And again, when I talk about repentance and everything like that, I, I, I need to also put this little side note in here because a lot of the times when people hear this, I used to have 10 fingers pointed at myself. You know, I'd hear people, I hear a pastor preach on this or my youth minister would preach on this and I think, oh yeah, I know this person, they need to repent. And you start thinking of everybody else you know that doesn't know Jesus and how they need to repent. Boy, I wish they were here. They need to hear this message about repentance and da 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 Remember who Jesus is talking to in these churches. It's the church. He's talking to church people, telling church people, hey, be careful, because if you're not careful, you can fall into just doing whatever, you can fall into whatever ways, and you can forget the purpose of what you're supposed to be about, to be the church, my hands, my feet, my eyes, my ears, my mouth, that the people are supposed to be the church. So he says, repent. And then the second thing he says is remember. Remember who we are, why we're here. Jesus said in Scripture, to remember what you have seen, and that's what the first century church was supposed to do, and we're supposed to do. We're supposed to remember who Jesus is. We're supposed to remember why Jesus Christ came. We're supposed to remember what it is that Jesus offered, and if we've accepted that gift into our lives, we're supposed to remember what He's asked of us, how He's asked us to live our life. And I know it, it, it gets hard, but, you know, it, it, and, and, and over the years as I've gone to conferences, over the years as I've talked with other pastors and read books and reports and all that, every time that there is a conflict within a church body, every time that a church seems to be stagnant or struggling, it's because the church has forgotten its purpose. And so once it's forgotten its purpose, it gets stagnant. It, 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 it's not doing what it's supposed to do. And, and it doesn't grow and there can be conflict with it. Because my friends, really what we're talking about here today, what Christ has asked us, it's not as they say, it's not rocket science. We're to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, body, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves. And we're to remember that Christ has to be the first part of every aspect of our life. You know, that we live for him each and every day. Not that we cannot enjoy the things of this world that God has given us. But again, like I said before, when those things of this world get in the way of living and fulfilling the purpose for which Christ has made us, then we have forgotten and we need to, to remember. Because what have we learned again? What have you heard? 
I know I've taught it here. I know other churches teach it uh, as well, that the WCC church is not this building that we meet in. It's the people that meet in this building. And what I just said were the hands and the feet of Christ. You know? So as we get ready to kind of wrap it up, maybe, maybe one of the things we could ask or do as we get ready this morning to kind of close it, what would Jesus say to us then if we're the church? What would he say to each and every one of us individually? What would he say? Would he say, hey, Dave, Dave, you need to repent <laughs> because you're doing some things, Dave, that are not what I called and created. They might not, like the church in Laodicea, they might not be bad, evil things. You're just doing things that I have not called you to do that are taking you away from the purpose of what I've created you to be. Maybe he would say that, or maybe he'd say, Dave, you need to remember Remember that I'm supposed to be first in your life in there. Remember how you're supposed to love God. Remember, Dave, how you're supposed to go into all the world, baptizing in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that Christ had taught and making disciples. And again, everything that I've shared today, I know for some people it can start throwing up flat or it can start throwing up like a fear factor. Oh, my word, I don't... Gosh, if I have to remember, if I have to repent, if I have to get that self-evaluating, that can be, we don't like that because that might mean I might, I might have to humble myself. I might have to confess that I've done some things wrong. I mean, it's only the second day of the year. I couldn't have made a mistake already, could I? You know, and, and, and have I already messed up in 22? For, well, 22's out. Now I've got to wait to 23 to be that good person, you know? I mean, but, but all kidding aside, sometimes, you know, we don't like that. That's a fearful. I might have to, gosh, repent. I'm... If, Remember, I heard, so I might have to go and ask somebody for forgiveness because that's what God asked me to do if I wrong people. And so that can bring a fear or the fact of you want me to go out into public and talk about Jesus and live like Jesus and, and be like Jesus and speak the truth in love. That can bring a great big fear factor. And I completely understand that. And as we come into 22, one of the challenges you're going to hear myself and the leadership encouraging you more and more is that those that are found need to find one other person they can share the good news of Christ with. I've heard it put this way by other churches, so I stole it from them because it's a really neat saying. It simply says this, found ones, find one. Found ones, find one. Those that have been found, who have found the love of Christ, understood the love of Christ, and brought the love of Christ and accept that into their lives, they have been found. They need to go out and they need to find at least one person in 22 that they can share that truth with so that person can know the love of Christ as well. And when I say that, I know. I know that can bring a fear factor there, but that's where faith needs to come in over fear that we're going to be learning about this year. Paul Harvey tells this story about a guy named Ray Blankenship. Maybe you've heard of it. Ray Blankenship was sitting in his house in Ohio one morning eating breakfast. It had rained all night before, and there was this, this, this culvert and, and everything, and this rain-flooded drainage ditch, actually, right outside, and the water was just gushing down. And when he looked out, he saw this little girl getting taken down by the water. Somewhere along the lane, she'd gotten too close to the water, and that massive rushing water grabbed her and pulled her in. And he knew not too far down there was a culvert that this drain ditch was going to go into, and he was going to go deep down, and this girl would drown. So he ran out his, his front door there, and he went racing along, seeing her, looking for something he could do. He got ahead of her, looking for anything he could grab to throw in, to try to pull her out and catch her before she got into this culvert and would go down there. And he realized he couldn't find anything, so he dove in himself. And he got himself in the water. He came up out of water, saw her, grabbed her. And the two of them were just kind of tumbling along with this rushing water. And just about three to five feet before they're getting ready to go into this culvert, he reaches up and he grabs a rock or something. I don't remember what it was on the side of the ditch. And, and it stops him. But the water is just pressure. The water is just hitting him hard. And he's just praying and thinking, if I could just hold on till help gets here, if I could just hold on till help gets here. And he does better than that. Before help gets there, he actually gets the two of them pulled out on the side. And then help does come there and help treats them and everything because they were, you know, treating them for shock and being in this cold water and, and, and everything. And then on April 2nd, 1989, Ray Blankenship was awarded the Coast Guard Silver Lifesaving Medal. And the award was very fitting for Ray for this selfless person was at even greater risk to himself than most people knew because Ray Blankenship does not know how to swim but yet he dove into this water. And that's the leap of faith that I believe we need to make sure we're willing to make for our life for Christ. Because my friends, 
Faith says, Lord, if it is you, let me come walk on water. Faith says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Faith says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And it's by faith in 22 we want to live, fulfilling the purpose for which God has created us. Because I believe that there are people in the surrounding area, Sherman, Williamsville, and surrounding area that don't love Jesus. And it's not because they don't want to. I believe it's because they don't know how to. And WCC, that's why we're here. That's one of our greatest purposes, to go out and connect those people to the love of Christ. So we're getting ready to come before these elements here that are up here uh, on these two tables. The elements that, that, that Christ gave us to remember his sacrifice, to remember his love and the life that he gave for us. And as you come forward and take the two cups and then go back to your seat, I want to encourage you, you know, as you thank God and praise God for that sacrifice and remember what that means to us each and every day because Christ gave his life for us. Also, maybe take some time and just ask God's Holy Spirit to speak to your heart. That are the things that you need to remember that maybe you have forgotten as the church, your purpose, maybe there's something individually you need to repent of. I don't know what it is. But let's take some time and let God speak to our hearts so as we come into 22, we can continue to be the church that God wants us to be. So if God tarries another 179 years, there's still a WCC family continuing to teach and preach and let the light of Christ shine. Amen? Let's go before God. Father... Thanks so much for this time that we can spend in your presence, that we could be here, that we could worship you through song, that we could hear your word and be reminded and encouraged by the love that you have for us, that we could take this time, Father God, and with these elements and remember the sacrifice of your love that was given for us, and we praise you so much for that, Lord. And also, as we just take this time, may your Holy Spirit just speak to our hearts. Help us, Father God, to remember. If there's areas where we need to step up and, and, and change our direction and repent, Father God, Lord, then help us to do that. Forgive us for forgetting our purpose, Lord. But thank you that we could gather here. Thank you today we could be reminded of that, Father. And thank you so much for your love and what that means to us. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.
God, you are so good. We pray that this morning that you just help us uh, to understand you a little bit better. God, help us to leave here knowing Jesus a little bit more than we did when we walked in this place. And God, help us to pray that same prayer every day this week. It's so easy to just let church be church and let life be life. But I pray that you can help us to make those one this week, this year. You're worthy of our worship. You're so good, and we thank you for that goodness, and we thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Well, church, thank you for being here this morning. We appreciate you. We hope you find a blessing. Have a great week.